Today's episode is proudly sponsored by the Rising Tide Mastermind. The Rising Tide Mastermind is one of my favorite things that I look forward to each and every week because I get to see people that have my best interest in mind. I know this because I have their best interest in mind. And when you get people together in a room like that, you can just imagine how people want to help other people. If this sounds like something you want to learn more about, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind. Welcome to the Scaling Up H2O podcast, the podcast where we scale up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. I'm Trace Blackmore, your host for this podcast. And Nation, one of the things I ask all of my guests after we do our interview is what books that they are reading. And I don't know if you are like me and you love to read because people just give away all their knowledge in books and then we can take that knowledge and we can go out there and do something with it. So I'm always looking for the next book that I can go out there and do something with. And one of the books I want to bring to your attention is Daniel Pink's Drive. It's been out for a couple of years. And there's so many books out there about what motivates people. And maybe back when some of those things were true, but people are motivated differently today. And I really think that Daniel Pink and the book is called Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us, really lays out how people are motivated. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is I was just speaking with somebody that I coach that is in charge of a team, and they were trying to motivate in a way that I think was yesteryear. And today, people are motivated differently. So in the book, Pink argues that traditional approaches to motivation, which rely on rewards and punishment, are not as effective as they once were. He introduces a concept of three instinct motivators, and he calls those autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy refers to the desire to be self-directed and have control over your own work. Mastery is the drive to improve and excel at tasks that really matter to you. And purpose involves a sense of working towards something larger than yourself. Now, think about that. Have you really looked at your systems to see if those are the three items that you are truly motivating your team over? So many companies out there are still motivating on rewarding and punishing, and that is a disconnect for so many people. Nation, I always talk about Audible, but it's also on a book. I enjoy Audible because I get to listen as I'm driving from account to account. So Daniel Peake's Drive is on Audible. It's also a very easy to carry paperback book, but it is one that I recommend. If you want to check it out, you can go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash drive And we've got an affiliate link all picked out for you to just make it super easy for you to go over to and get your copy of Drive. Now, when I mention an affiliate link, what that is, that is a link that we are sending you directly to Amazon, directly to that book Drive. And Amazon, just to say thank you for sending you there, will send us a slight commission. Now, that won't cost you a dime extra, but it is something that helps us pay some bills around here. So if you do decide to get the book drive by clicking that link or going to scalinguph2o.com forward slash drive and just typing that whole thing out by yourself, I want to thank you for that. And I also know you are going to thank yourself for reading that book. I think it's one of the the best books that we've read in a long time. And when I said we, I'm talking about the Rising Tide Mastermind. That's a group I started about four years ago where we get together, we try to process issues. Our goal is to get each other further faster while having fun. And we also read books along the way. 
That was one of the books that we read last year, and we just had so much great conversation around that book. So do yourself a favor, get a copy of Drive, and when you see me, let me know what you think about it. Scaling Up Nation, a few events that you might want to put on your calendar is the 2024 Water Reuse Symposium taking place in Denver, Colorado, March 11th through 14th, hosted by Water Reuse. So we're going to have all the information on this symposium for you to find out if this is where you need to be. And while you're there, you can check out this one, the Pennsylvania Brownfields Conference. That's taking place in State College, Pennsylvania, March 25th through 27th. This one is all about the Pennsylvania Brownfields program and how to address abandoned and dilapidated building. Of course, they're going to talk about PFAS and all things related to that. This is hosted by the Western Pennsylvania Engineers Society, and they're the people that put on the International Water Conference. I had the distinct privilege of being the keynote speaker at the International Water Conference put on by the Engineers Society of Western Pennsylvania this past year. And if the Brownsville Conference is anything close to the International Water Conference, you are wanting to be there. So be sure to check that out on our events page. Last week, I went into detail about the 2024 Association of Water Technologies Technical Training Conference. And of course, there's two different events that you can attend. Some people attend one, some people attend both because there's so many choices that you can attend at that conference. Why not sign up for both? Your first opportunity is going to be March 6th through 9th in Frisco, Texas. And your second opportunity is going to be April 17th through 20th in Cleveland, Ohio. Now, if you want to learn more about this conference, listen to last week's episode, which is episode 350 where I go into exactly what we're talking about, all the courses that are available, and my plea to get you to sign up because I want to see you there because I'm going to be there. Nation, I love meeting members of the Scaling Up Nation. So whenever you are at an industrial water conference, look for me, look for somebody that's on the Scaling Up H2O team. And by all means, if you have a Scaling Up H2O button, be sure to wear that because that lets everybody there know that you are part of the Scaling Up Nation and that allows you to network with people that are also members of the Scaling Up Nation. If you don't have a button, look for either myself or somebody on the Scaling Up H2O team at one of those conferences, and we will make sure to get you one. Well, Nation, we always love to bring you great guests. And of course, we're finding those great guests because many of you are letting us know who we need to reach out to and who we need to talk to. And that's what happened today. So here is our latest interview. My lab partner today is Dr. Kelly Zier of Garrett Callahan. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you, Trace. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited to talk with you today. I am excited to talk with you. And we've got a lot of landscape to cover today. Before we dive into that, do you mind telling the Scaling Up Nation a bit about yourself? Absolutely. So I've been in the water industry for about 30 years, which is um, interesting to look back and realize I have so much experience for being so young, right? But I started right after my PhD in chemistry. And the fun thing about being in the water industry is that prior to joining it, everything I did for graduate school was sensitive to both air and water. And the first thing that happened to me within two weeks of getting my first professional job is that I was introduced as a reverse osmosis expert. That to me meant that I should look wise, keep silent, and take notes. And eventually I did grow into that role, but it was kind of fun to be thrown into the deep end and realize that you had to learn to swim. One of my favorite questions to ask my guests, because there's never the same answer, how did you get involved in water treatment? So I was a graduate student at The Ohio State University, finishing up my PhD and interviewing with a number of people. 
And some of the interviews had actually taken place at an American Chemical Society meeting. And it was there that I first met representatives of a company that you might know called Nalco. And they introduced water chemistry to me and they came through with one of my offers. And it was a good location. It was a great company. And although I had not studied that area of expertise before, back in that day, getting the PhD meant you knew how to learn stuff. And so I said to myself, I can learn this water. And that's where we started. It has been endlessly fascinating since then. My prior experience made me think, yeah, water, okay, at hydrogen bonds, and that's cool. But other than that, you know, it's kind of boring. Turns out it's absolutely not boring in so many ways. And it's led me to learn so many different things because, as I'd like to get into later, everything that we wear or eat or touch or consume as consumers has a water component to it. And so being a water treatment expert means that when your customer runs into a problem, you get to learn their industry, how water impacts their industry, and then what you can do to help make them more profitable. So it's been endlessly fascinating. I have never been bored a day in this industry. And when I hear of people saying that, oh, I don't know, this is for me, or I am bored, I don't think they're doing it right. Because if you are a lifetime learner, there is just so much in this industry. It is wonderful. And I'll tell you, it's great for cocktail parties because there's always a snippet of something that you've learned. I've learned a little bit about how tires are made in molds, how we determine what's safe to eat based on studies that were done with prison food, and uh, how pharmaceuticals come to be coated in something that tastes not like whatever the pharmaceutical we're taking tastes like. It's, it's fascinating, and that's just three examples of different things that we've learned. Well, you bring up cocktail parties, and that's something I think our industry has difficulty with because the question inevitably comes up, what do you do? How do you answer that question? Well, it's been a while for me to learn how to answer that question. But one of the things I do is that I help industries save money and keep their equipment in better health over the long haul. So that's one of the things I do. But the other thing is that I help keep all of the water in our world safer and more readily available for people to use and enjoy. So speaking of the water we have available to us, we have the same amount of water today that we've always had, but you can't turn on the news without somebody in the world having a water shortage. Uh, maybe there's an issue going on locally in the United States, but we hear this all the time. So how do we put that together? We've got more water than we do land on this planet, but yet we don't have enough water. That's a great question, Trace. And the, the fact is, if you want to put numbers to that, three quarters of the earth is covered with water. 98% of that is salt water or saline water, which is not useful for drinking. It's not useful for industrial. And so it's not that we have a shortage of water because as you said, we really do have the same water we've had since the earth first cooled. But what's happening is that we're using it more and more frequently than we used to in the past. And part of that is population growth. Part of that are the changes that come with global climate change, because now if it's warmer in the world, more water, and for those of you that know the hydrologic cycle, basically nature distills water from these bodies of water and sucks it up into the clouds where it's pure water form, brings it back to us in the form of precipitation, whether that's rain or snow. And the problem is that more water is getting sucked up into the form that then needs to precipitate. And so we get more storms and floods. And when you get storms and floods, you get lots of water, but it doesn't all soak into the ground and soak through the ground down into uh, the underground storage areas called aquifers. And when that happens, it just runs back into the large bodies of water, like the, the lakes and the oceans. And so it's there, but it's not useful and available to us. We had a guest on not too terribly long ago, and she made us aware that basically we all think we can just go anywhere on the planet, we can drill a hole deep enough, and we can find water. But exactly as you said, the water is not getting back to those locations, and eventually we're going to have a major problem. 
some of the problems that happen when that happens, and California is an example where you can see some of this, the water in those underground aquifers doesn't replace. And what happens is now the ground starts to shrink into those aquifers. So the height of our elevation, if you will, lowers because those aquifers no longer can support the ground above it. And so things shrink and compact. And now we have more ocean water. And how are we going to deal with that? So it is truly an issue worth understanding. And it impacts us in so many different ways that a sound bite can't encapsulate all of what we have to know about water to understand it. We're obviously using water much more frequently and in different ways than we have in the past. You said we really can't touch any product, any service without uh, water touching it first. Can you expand a little on that? Absolutely. So I, I'd like to have a pop quiz for everyone out there who's listening, and you can be their proxy trace. But how much water do you think it takes to produce a single gallon of gasoline fuel? You know, I've got a slide that I'll teach that has different things with water, but I don't have gasoline on. I'm going to think it's probably about a thousand gallons of water. You are unique in that you guess a lot higher than most people. It's a anywhere between 40 and 100 gallons of water per gallon of gasoline, depending on how you calculate it. And that's because water is used in drilling and bringing oil up from the areas where it resides beneath the earth, which is a complete and different topic. But no, it's not in a big underground lake down there. It needs a little bit more work to bring it up. And then it has to be refined into the gasoline fuel. And then it depends on do you count the transportation to get it to the place where an individual would buy it. So it's interesting that we have that. And inevitably these days I get the question, well, what about if we go to an electric vehicle instead of a gasoline powered vehicle? And it turns out to get the electrical equivalent of a gallon of gasoline, you will end up spending between 650 and 2000 gallons of water to produce that electrical energy. And that leads to something that I'd like to call the water footprint of an individual user. And so much as we have a carbon footprint, we can think that we have a water footprint. Some of the products that I would like to talk about and just raise some awareness. So it takes about 75,000 gallons of water to produce a ton of steel. If you're going to make that into a car, a car actually takes about 80,000 gallons of water to produce. That's an average size vehicle. And 2,000 of that is for the set of tires that you're going to put on that car. Tires are made in molds, molds need to be cooled, et cetera, and so forth. And you may be beginning to see the trend here of how we use water, often in industrial cooling of a process. Let's go not from uh, big things like that, but to everyday consumer products. It takes almost 3,200 gallons of water to produce a single cell phone. And we can't get through our days without our communication devices. It takes 53 gallons of water for a gigabyte of data. So people think that sites that store data and use data, whether that is something like Google or Facebook or eBay or Etsy or anything that has an online presence, even our online banking, all of that data is stored in data halls in places. And just like your home computer produces a lot of heat and energy when it runs, these data halls produce enormous amounts of energy And they need to be cooled down in order to keep your data safe and to keep everything from overheating. And water is one of the ways that things are cooled down through humidified air. That's why all of these processes, as much as they feel free to us as end users, they're actually costly and they use a lot of water. So we're putting water back in different places than we pulled it from. We're using water at a greater rate than we ever have before. And all of us want our goods and services, so we still need to produce those. What do we do? So that's exactly the question we have to answer. And here's, you hit the nail on the head exactly when you said we're using more. So if you look at population curves, we're expected to reach about 10 billion in population by the year 2050. And if you compare the rise in population to the rise in energy and water usage, you can see a huge gap. So each person uses a lot more water and energy than ever before. 
And that's because we all like nice things. We like cars, we like cell phones, we like data, we like uh, cotton shirts and uh, canned vegetables. All of those things take water to produce. And so what that means for us is that while nature has a way of purifying the water that we use if it were left alone to do its thing, it's a slow process. Nature filters water through rocks back down into those aquifers where we draw it up and then we use it again. We have to mimic what nature does, but mimic it much faster if we want to purify that water so that the billions of us can have all the nice things that we want to have in our lives. And we can do that, but we have to be conscious of how we do it, how we conserve, and how we quickly clean up what we've used and reuse it. Well, that's where we're going next. What are the technologies available for us to use today and where are they going? To answer that, one of the questions, and this comes down to almost another pop quiz. So I'm going to set you up here and tell you that the United States water use, and we'll just stick in the continental U.S., it's over 410 trillion gallons per day. Wow. Almost 50% of that water has a specific use. The top three categories, 50% goes to one use, 31% goes to another high use, and then 12% to the third. And those three things that I want you to think about is public supply and domestic water, irrigation, and thermal electric cooling. So of those three things, which do you think most people would guess is the highest user? Well, I want to say cooling because that's the industry that we're in, but I'm not sure what the right answer is. And you're absolutely correct, Trace. And and everybody in our industry has an edge over most people. So almost half of the U.S. water usage, and I would venture to say this is pretty true with all of the industrialized world, goes to cooling. The next biggest slice, that 31% slice, goes to agriculture. And depending on where your state is or what you're looking at, that slice is bigger or smaller for you. So in California, actually, the agriculture slice is closer to 80% for them than the cooling slice. I can't remember the exact number, but I was just flabbergasted when I learned how much water an almond consumes. I, it was, I can't remember the number, but it was huge. There was some saying, and I'm not sure this is entirely true, but it was like one gallon of water per one almond or something like that. Those those trees soak up a lot of water. And, and one of the things, and this is a little out of order of where you might be thinking about it, but one of the ways to do better use of our water is to look at what we're growing and where we're growing it. So if you look at California and say that that's a water-stressed industry or water-stressed state, It's probably not the state where you want to grow water-intensive crops like almonds and rice. Maybe you want to grow those down in the southern U.S. where we tend to have a lot more water and, and a lot more floods. And so planting more native crops that are designed for your particular region's climate makes sense. And so in some ways, that's one thing that we can do to help with water. Now, what we typically do, and that brings me down to that 12%, 12% of our water is used for domestic supply. And so typically what happens when there's a drought, some politician will get on the news and they'll say, local politician, you shall water your lawn only every third day or, you know, this side of the street, Monday, Tuesday, that side of the street, Wednesday, Thursday, and nobody the rest of the week. So they're attacking a really small portion of the problem because there's great optics there. But whether you turn your water off when you brush your teeth or not, the way to change water and to change our usage of it and and to promote better water use is to look at that cooling piece and also the agricultural piece, because those are where we're going to get our biggest ways to becoming more sustainable. And like I said before, lucky for us, because that's the industry that we are in. So what are some things that you are working on to help this endeavor? Well, one of the things that I am working on is in conjunction with my people who focus specifically on cooling water, and that is when you're cooling an industrial process, there's a thing that most of our listeners will know about called cycles of concentration, and that's how many times you use the water over and over again before it becomes so laden in minerals 
that you can't realistically use it over. And then you have to pull some of that water off and replace it with fresh water. Well, there are some places where people are maybe using three cycles of concentration. And we did a study for a client who shall remain nameless, but this client was doing about three cycles of concentration. We found that if we could take them up to six cycles of concentration, that they would save about one and a half million gallons of water per year. And if I pull up some information here, yeah, they were using 12 million gallons per year for one specific cooling feature. And on that feature, if we could drive the cycles up, they would save about one and a half million gallons. The way to do that was to add cleaner water at the beginning of the process so that there was less dissolved material and you could do the cycling up more. And that they would do through using a reverse osmosis type of process. And for those who are not familiar, reverse osmosis basically takes water and splits it into a stream where you've got 98% of the solids removed from one stream and all of those solids concentrated in an exit or concentrate stream. The challenge with doing that is that the reverse osmosis also has a waste stream that has to be accounted for. And so we did some studies with this client and we said, oh, you know, you might be able to save two and a half million gallons from this, but you have to take the RO waste into consideration. So you're not really, it's down to one and a half. And that frightens people. But I am happy to say that I've been working with Garrett Callahan and intimately with a few other inventors there. And we have invented a process and patented process whereby we take the waste from the cooling water systems and the blowdown or the waste from those tower systems, and we process them in a way that is quick and efficient and removes all of the dissolved or um, slurry minerals that are in the system, brings that out to a waste material that can be up to 90 or more percent dry, and then reprocesses the water so that it is clean, almost RO permeate quality water for the customers to start using again. So when you couple those two species together, what you have is a way of getting to a minimal liquid discharge situation. Now, within the industry, there's been this holy grail called zero liquid discharge. And zero is a hard number to reach. Zero is even a hard number to get close to. And if you're trying to get close to zero, it's going to cost you lots and lots of money. So the idea behind our invention was we wanted a less expensive way to get close to zero and help smaller customers that didn't have deep pockets that could spend hundreds of millions of dollars on equipment to be able to recycle and reuse their water. I'm sure everybody listening has a story where a client was trying to get to zero, and that's probably followed by some sort of disaster story. I'll share one with you. It's probably similar to what a lot of people have had. Customer just decided we're not going to bleed anymore. Well, guess what happened to their system? Exactly what everybody's thinking. That is what happened, and we don't want that to happen. You said we've got to start with cleaner water. So... What's a good way to have a conversation with a customer? They're trying to be environmentally conscious. They don't understand all the things that we know. Maybe sometimes they even think they know more than we know. How do we have a conversation so everybody's involved in that decision? That's a really great topic to discuss. And I think it has to start with us looking at our customers and knowing that they're very knowledgeable in their specific area of application. And if you want someone to respect your knowledge, you have to start by respecting their knowledge. So that's the first thing that we have to do. And then it really makes sense to go into the conversation and say, what issues or problems are you having that you observe with your system? What's your pain point? What is causing you sleepless nights? And so once we start there, then we can start talking about what the problems are and begin to say, you know, what if I could give you something that would take away 50% of those problems? Would you be interested in learning more? And realistically, many of our solutions can take away more than that. But if we start by listening and respecting their problems, then we can start by saying, here are some experiences that we've had where we've been able to do this for another customer. So with the customer I was telling you about a few minutes ago, we presented three scenarios and we said, one way that you can 
be more efficient with your water usage. They're in a water-stressed area, so water usage fluctuates wildly over the course of the year, and it depends on rainfall and snow melt and conditions like that. So we started out by saying, if you blend your cooling water and drive your cycles up, you could save one and a half million gallons of water. If you couple that with this recovery process that we are calling AROS, which is aqueous recovery optimization system or aqueous reuse optimization system, then we could save you three and a half million gallons per year on this site. Now, if you wanted to go all the way to a zero liquid discharge process and weren't content to discharge a little water, then you could save almost four million gallons per year, but the costs are wildly different. So the capital equipment cost to save three and a half million a year, for this particular user, it was under 500,000. If they wanted to go all the way to a zero liquid discharge, it was over 7 million in capital costs alone. That is quite the delta. Yes. And once you position it that way and you say, here are the options, everybody that was listening to this said, it's very clear which direction we want to go now. And it's only because I want to be fair and show you, yes, I'm going to cost you money. All solutions cost people money. But are you spending the money wisely and what are you getting for it? That's a great way to have that conversation. And I see t-shirts in our future. It's not about getting to zero. I think we talk about that with Legionella. Of course, we want zero Legionnaire's disease, but we can't have zero Legionella bacteria in a system. And Probably not reasonable to aim for zero discharge. I like the t-shirt idea. I think that's great. We can't get to zero, but we can get close. And when you know the price tag, you're going to want to get close instead of getting to zero. Exactly. And, And getting to zero costs. And when we start talking about these things, everything is, as I said earlier, it's very complicated. So go back to my car example and the water footprint for a gallon of gasoline versus the water footprint for an electric car. Most of the people listening to this broadcast know that electric cars don't mean we're going away from fossil fuels. Most of our consumers that we talk to at the cocktail parties may or may not know that. What it means is that the fossil fuel is burned in a centralized location at the power plant to make electricity. And here we can take advantage of equipment and processes that help limit dangerous emissions and help maximize the thermal energy that we get out of using our fossil fuels. Now, I'm a big proponent in pushing people to use the most sustainable fuel they can because fossil fuels and fossil fuels only or fossil products only can be used for certain activities. And I'd like to let them be in the back pocket for all the things that only they can do and take the rest of the burden off of them. But the point is that it's a large system and there are costs and benefits everywhere. The old question used to be a long ago, people would say cloth diapers or disposable diapers. And the answer to that question is, do you have more land for disposing solid waste or do you have more water for washing? Because that is really the individual calculation that a region should be doing. We talked about T-shirts earlier. I just feel that it's appropriate that I share this with you. I have a Tesla T-shirt that says, because there's only so much decomposed dinosaur to go around. (laughs) I love that one. I love it. So what do you want every water treater to know from this interview? And what do you want them to start doing? All of you out there that are water treaters need to understand how very valuable you are to the industry and the world. We like to live in our own little bubble and think that we're somehow special in that way, but not widely applicable to an everyday person. And that's not true. The specialized knowledge that we have is important to making our world a better, happier place to live. And I think that we tend to undervalue ourselves. And that's a human condition. Humans always undervalue themselves. So water treaters out there, realize that you're not only extending the life of your customer's equipment, you're not only making them be able to produce more goods and services in a more profitable manner, but that you are doing things that make our planet more sustainable and you're doing things that allow more people to have good, healthy lives because of the work you do with managing our water resources. 
So understand how very important you are. If somebody is not able to deploy the technology that you're talking about, what are some quick wins that water treaters can do to help with that cooling usage on our water consumption? So as a water treater, we also have to make sure we're doing everything to keep that process, the cooling process, healthy. And so all of us are going to throw some sort of chemical components into a system. And the world at large likes to bad mouth anything that contains chemicals, if you will, and they don't understand that oxygen and and, uh, water and all of that are actually chemicals to those of us that understand them. But uh, know that you're going to have to have some sort of a treatment, some sort of a treatment that keeps your, your piping and your heat transfer surfaces clean of debris. And that means clean of scale, clean of foulance, clean of anything else that's going to cause a problem. Make sure also that corrosion is controlled effectively in all of your towers so that you're not rusting through your pipes and contributing to the dissolved material load with iron oxides or other metal rusting materials, if you will. So all of those things need to happen. And when you optimize that and the energy usage, you're already helping your customer do the best that he can. And from there, institute whatever kinds of pre-treatments to the water that goes to that tower that you need. We have a saying, at least among the people that have listened to me or trained with me about reverse osmosis and other things, but the saying is that pretreatment is the key to everything. And so we have to understand that the minute the water comes out of the ground, there are technologies to help us remove bad actors. Not that they're bad per se in and of themselves, but that they can become bad for equipment if they're allowed to have free reign in situations where they're concentrated or something like that. So we have to start at that minute to begin to treat and clean the water. And then when it leaves the cooling system, clean it up as best you can so that you can return it to that system. Kelly, is there anything that you want to leave that resonates with our audience? Well, for those of you that like to have a cup of coffee in the morning or go out and have a drink after work, know that if we don't have good, clean water, we also don't have cocktail hour or anything to make that coffee with. So let's keep reusing that water. Keep it clean. Got to have that coffee. Got to have it. Kelly, I've got a few lightning round questions for you. Are you ready? Oh, dear. These are the scary ones. Sure. Go for it. Nothing scary about them. You're going to do fine. Now, the double point value will get you ahead in the game. So choose your answer wisely. I have no idea what I'm saying. All right, here we go. If you could go back in time and talk to your former self on your first day when you were introduced as a reverse osmosis specialist, what advice would you give yourself? The thing that I would tell my former self is it's okay not to know everything. Get comfortable with feeling stupid because you're not going to know everything. Learn to find good resources. And the minute you get comfortable with that, your career and your life is just going to accelerate in ways you couldn't even imagine. That is great advice. What are the last few books that you've read? So I'm in the process actually of rereading some books. One is The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell, which is a really fascinating essay series on how certain things take off and become popular. The other is the Poisoner's Handbook. And while it sounds like it's about poison, it's it's by an author by the name of uh, Deborah Bloom. And it's a fascinating look into the 1920s and 1930s New York era forensics, where the whole science of modern forensics began to be developed by these two pioneering gentlemen who were the coroner and his chemist, respectively. It's, it's chock full of fascinating stories. And as an aside, I, I write murder mysteries and I often use poisons. And so I love collecting stories about poisons, hence me going back to review that every periodically once in a while. All right, we have to unpack that. Tell us about some of the books that you have written and how we can read them. So um, I write under my married name or my husband's name, so I write as Kelly Z. Riley. And the series is called the Undercover Cat Series, where I imagined a water treatment chemist, much like myself, who walked into work and found her boss dead and determined that smart people ought to be able to figure out who killed the boss. 
And so as she does this, she uses her scientific knowledge to help figure that out. And from then on, I just took off on the fun side and I made one of her colleagues a a spy. And I won't tell you if any of my colleagues are or not, because that's (laughs) part of the code. And we go on missions where she uses her science knowledge to help solve crimes. And it's I have enormous amounts of fun writing this. Are these available for other people to read? They are available. The best place to get started would be my website, which is Kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Z-R-I-L-E-Y dot net. And they're at all major booksellers and you can order them. And yes, I'd love to have a few more readers jump on in. Well, you better believe we're going to put that on our show notes page. So get ready for those sales to start flooding in. I'm perfectly happy to do that. And if your group wants me to talk about uh, literary poisons, I can do that as well. But I we might have to have you back. You never know when you've got somebody you need some poison for. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's very cathartic to be able to well, look at somebody that annoys you one day and say, you're dying in a book. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. I'm curious, what are some of your favorite water chemistry reference books? So I like anything by Wes Byrne. He's he's excellent. We've had him on the show. And the Nalco Water Treatment Handbooks are also excellent resources. That's from back in the day when they were top of the line and really um, pushing the envelope. So those are, are some of my favorites. My friend, Mr. Google, helps me with a lot of things these days, but you have to carefully vet what he comes back with because like all AIs, he's not necessarily self-editing. We all know what you're talking about. So when Hollywood hears this podcast and they start writing the script about your life, who do you want playing Dr. Kelly? You know, I gave this question a little bit of thought, and I have to say that Julia Roberts did an awesome Aaron Brockovich, so she probably could channel me as well. I know I've told that story on the podcast, but I don't know if I've told you. My wife took me to see Aaron Brockovich. I did not want to see it. It did not seem exciting to me. It was like my favorite movie of all time. It was about cooling towers. But see, our stuff is really cool, and we undersell ourselves. We forget how awesome and cool we can be. And, you know, when you're played by a Hollywood blockbuster, that helps. I have trouble with a lot of things, and that was not one of them, but but a lot of scientific purported entertainment, I have trouble with if it hits too close to home. So I'm a fan of the Big Bang Theory. I think that they got the science geeks exactly right in many cases. But when it comes to the reverse osmosis episode, there are so many holes I could poke in it. I just can't watch that one without cringing. Understood. My final question for you, if you can talk with anybody throughout history, who would it be with and why? You know, I think I would go back to those people that were in the laboratory that were working behind the scenes and just say that someday your work is going to turn into something that really seriously impacts the world. I mean, we know about Pasteur and Lavoisier and and a number of other people, but we don't know about all the chemists and, and scientists on whose backs they built their knowledge. So I would like to find those people and let them know that you are important and what you are doing is so worthwhile because we don't get enough praise in our life and they need a little bit of love from us. Kelly, for those listeners that want to find out more about the technology that you are creating, are they able to license that from you? Is it just a Garrett Callahan product? How is that? At the moment, the technology that we're creating is patented to Garrett Callahan. And so right now, we are rolling it out as our product, and we have some equipment partners that work with us. But I encourage anyone that wants to think about licensing this technology or otherwise getting involved to reach out to me because we're very open to looking at models that make the world better for all of us and at the same time protect, of course, our intellectual property in ways that help make it also accessible. If it's all right, I'll put your contact information on our show notes page. That would be fine. I would like to give you a couple of things. First, the website to go to would be garrettcallahan.com, which I think you already have. We have a dedicated email, and that is ro underscore info at g-c.com, which would be good. And then if you want to put my personal, it would be kzire at g-c.com. 
Well, Kelly, thank you so much for coming on the Scaling Up H2O podcast. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you for having me. I've truly enjoyed this. Nation, the job of the Scaling Up H2O podcast is to make sure we are always learning as we are driving from account to account. Of course, we try to do that each and every episode. And how we do that is from members like you and letting us know what we need to talk about, who we need to talk to. So if you've got an idea, you can go to scalinguph2o.com, go over to our show ideas page. And that, of course, is how we are keeping more and more shows in the Scaling Up H2O library. Nation, a show that I want to mention a couple shows back was episode 307. That was with our friend Mike Soler. He's a member of the International Water Conference. I mentioned that at the top of the show. And Mike is a member of the executive committee. But what Mike did on episode 307 was he told us how we should look at crafting and presenting a technical paper. Here's a challenge I have for all of you. We always talk about all of these conferences at the beginning of the show, and we want you to attend, but have you ever considered actually participating in some of these conferences? I know we have so much knowledge out there within the Scaling Up Nation, and I want to encourage everybody out there in the Scaling Up Nation to consider presenting a paper at a conference. Now, typically about six or so months before the conference, whoever's hosting the conference sends out requests for abstracts. An abstract is not the complete paper. The abstract is what you are going to talk about. And then typically you're going to agree to some sort of due date. There's normally some sort of a committee that looks at all the abstracts and they say, with the show that we're trying to put on, these are the papers or these are the abstracts that we think are gonna make a good show. And then you become selected. Once you're selected, you are now committed to that program because they are counting on you to present the technical paper that you said you would on your abstract. I know that there is a technical presentation in everybody that is listening to this podcast. So I'm going to urge you to go to episode 307 to learn how to put something like that together, how to put your technical presentation together And when you get to deliver information that you know or that you're testing, you're going to know that information so much better. And if you haven't presented a lot or you haven't presented in a while, getting in front of a bunch of people as you present really hones your skills when you communicate to people each and every day. So I hope that motivates you to go out and at least look at trying to present a paper at one of these conferences that we talk about on all of these episodes. I am sure there's one out there that exactly meets something that you can talk about. And if you want to go look, go to scalinguph2o.com, go over to our events page, and see which one of those conferences matches up best with the type of water treatment that you practice. And hopefully, I will see you present at one of those conferences. You know, one of the guys that I've seen present at several conferences many times is James McDonald. And here is a brand new Drop by Drop with James. Welcome to Drop by Drop with James, the podcast segment where we wonder, explore, think about, imagine, and learn industrial water treatment, you guessed it, drop by drop, together. It's in the middle of winter. It's cold. You've had a long day as an industrial water treatment professional battling scale, corrosion, unwanted microbiological activity, and inefficiencies. You're tired. You just want to go home, kick your feet up, relax, and get warm. You forget to take your test kit out of the car. You wake up in the morning, drive to your next industrial water treatment system, open up your test kit, and it is frozen 
solid. What do you do? Do you run around in circles? Do you set the test kit as closely to a boiler as you dare to thaw it out? Do you dunk it in hot water? The first thing you should do is learn your lesson and never let your test kit freeze again. Ever. Cross my heart, hope to fly, stick a cupcake in my eye. I'll admit, I learned my lesson the hard way. Next, I consulted with a trusty test kit manufacturing expert, and his suggestion is to allow it to thaw at room temperature. He said, do not artificially heat it up, even in hot water. Most reagents are likely to recover. To be safe, you should compare your test results to new reagents or another rep's results. Personally, I found my iodide iodate titration solution used in the sulfite test was never the same after it froze and gave me low readings. You could also just replace all your reagents, but I understand this could get expensive. Another thing to consider when a test kit freezes is the impact upon testing equipment such as the pH probe, which may have cracked or broken as its internal solution froze and expanded. Plus, plunging a cold pH probe into a warm solution may induce cracking as well. I'm James McDonald, and I want to encourage you to be like water by forming bonds with those around you, dissolving new knowledge, and making worthy ripples drop by drop. Thanks, James. And again, if you ever need to catch up on Drop by Drop with James, we've got all of those on our website. So don't worry, we can catch you up. And if you haven't listened to every single episode, don't worry about that either, because we've got them all on your favorite podcast player. We can catch you up on that as well. And in addition to that, we'll have a brand new episode for you next week. Until then, take care, folks.